Hello everyone and welcome back. I have lately been absolutely inundated on TikTok with people trying to figure out what their color season is. Now for those that don't know, it's essentially a color analysis tool where you look at all of your different attributes in terms of skin tones, hair, eyes, all of those things, and figure out which one of the four season categories you fit into, and then perhaps break it down into another three from there, so 12 total categories that will then supposedly tell you exactly what colors you should be able to wear that will be the most flattering for your colors. I don't know if it's because I have a really hard time figuring this out for me or if this is just the historian in me, but I really want to understand where this came from, where it got started, and how it's actually supposed to work because I guarantee someone didn't just come up with this entire thing overnight. There has to be more to the history than that. And not surprisingly, there is. So we're going to start working our way backwards this time to figure out where all of this came from. As for the precise idea of color seasons, well, honestly, that's not even that simple to track. So if we go back to the 1980s, which some of the videos that I've watched do mention that that is where it originates, really became trendy in the 1980s. As we go back to that, one of the first things we'll come across is Color Me Beautiful by Carol Jackson. And this book came out in 1980 and talks about the different color seasons and goes into great detail about the base four color seasons, which seems to be as far as most of these versions go back then. The 12 color seasons adjustment seems to be a little bit more recent. But Jackson's book was not the beginning of the color season concept. In fact, Color Me Beautiful Incorporated had been established by 1981 and she was doing a really big business in not only being a color analyst herself, but in training other people. One article from 1983 talks to one of the people that have been trained under her system and you might recognize the name as yes this is the kibbe that later in 1987 comes up with the kibbe body types so as of 1983 he was actually trained as a color analyst and was helping people figuring out what season they were under the carol jackson system now those Analyst appointments cost anywhere from $35 to $300 at that point in time, which is a good amount of money in the 1980s, but nowhere near the amount of money that it cost to become an analyst. The training process for the Jackson program was $3,500 for a two week course. This was not the most expensive option as another similar company actually charged $5,000 in order to do a one month course and then another 10,000 on top of that in order to get your hands on the color cards that would allow you to actually analyze people. There was definitely a uh, system working at this point in time. These were by no means the only two companies out there. There were so many different variations on the system, whether people were coming up with their own versions of how to analyze people's colors or working off of the well-established versions. And in fact, Carol Jackson says that she first picked up this idea in 1973 when she was visiting her sister in San Francisco. It's pretty likely that what she experienced out there actually came from Suzanne Cagill, another famous proponent of the color seasons. She she wrote a book called Color, The Essence of You, which came out in 1980, but she had been doing color analysis for quite a while before that point. And she takes it very seriously. A 1979 article with Cagle, she describes herself as being a chromatic therapist of sorts, a self-styled dispenser of rainbow cures for a price. And that price was usually around $150 to $200. Cagill claims that she actually came up with the idea of color seasons back in 1943 in the same article, and that she had come to understand how important this whole thing was to people, that it wasn't just telling people what colors they should wear, but it was helping people to understand themselves, their personalities, to essentially give them therapy in a sense, so that way they would be happier with themselves and their appearance. And she also understands how difficult this can be when it comes to the negative aspects of the whole thing, because being told you shouldn't wear all of these colors that you love can be rather devastating. It can also be financially devastating if the vast majority of the clothing you own is within the do not wear section. And emotionally, it's just rather difficult to deal with the whole thing. And now this is a really important thing in general because while all of these are meant to be suggestions that are helpful for people to figure out their closet, a lot of the companies that are offering these services still today don't really acknowledge the fact that this is not a perfect system and 
especially when it was something that they were establishing in the 1970s and 80s. You go to one person and you might get diagnosed as one season, a different person with a different season, and the whole thing can be rather confusing because it is not a perfect science. And a lot of it's just simply built on what's trending at the time and how you feel about the way that you look, or in some cases, I suppose, how the person you're paying feels about the way that you look. One of the interesting things that I found was even though she named out the four seasons as we're used to them, she also decided to give them secondary names, which seemed to change over time. I couldn't find complete lists for all of the different versions, but in 1977, she called her palettes by Butterfly Spring, Princess Summer, Pagan Autumn, and Ballerina Winter. So definitely descriptions that were meant to evoke popular concepts at the time, more so than just the seasons. And as for her claim that she invented it in 1943, I couldn't find anything that really denies that claim. If I go back to 1961, there is a book from Johannes Itten, which does talk about color seasons, but it's more to do with art. And actually going back even further to 1953, the first article that I could find that talked about color seasons was actually interviewing Suzanne Cagle to talk about her version of that. It's entirely a possibility that she was the one that came up with that in 1943. But as for the idea of color analysis, she definitely did not invent that. She just categorized it in her own way. As for the origins of color analysis, that takes us back so much further. First, we're going to look at the 1920s and 30s. This is where it really takes off as an offering where you could go into the store and have your color analyzed, or as they would later call it in the 1970s, having your color done. And one of the great examples of this in the 1930s is Max Factor. They started offering free analysis for people to come in and figure out what sort of makeup Makeup colors they should be wearing. So it makes perfect sense as Max Factor is selling makeup to offer this service to people to bring them in, help them figure out what sort of colors they should be wearing in an era where makeup was first beginning to be acceptable as an everyday thing. And things like red lipstick were really common and popular, but exactly what tone of red lipstick should you wear? It can be overwhelming. So it makes sense that there was a huge boom for this when makeup was first really accepted. There were plenty of articles and books around the same time as well that recommended what color tones you should wear depending on your personal tones. One from 1931 was called Color and Line in Dress from Lauren Hempstead, and she actually produced a rather extensive book and line of articles on this. In 1928, Women's Wear Daily worked with her to put out a very lengthy series of articles when they broke down appearance into certain subsections of cool, warm, intermediate, and dealing with the population with white or gray hair. Aside from this very extensive large chart, she also went through and wrote an article on each one of those four, as well as talking about how to match your clothing to your eye color, your lip color, your hair color, how to actually take all of this information, test it out, and figure out how to apply it, how to deal with so many different variations on this if you say are the sort of person that goes out and takes part in the fad of tanning. For example, things might start to change in terms of what colors look good on you. So she went into great detail over the process of a few months in these articles that came out every single week to try and talk about what colors worked for what types of complexions. Now it's really important to note at this point that there is a limiting factor in a lot of these early versions, no different than honestly, we still have a limiting factor today. And that is most of these color analysis tools are meant to work on a very limited range of appearances, particularly light skin tones. They also don't do well to acknowledge the variety of eye color, hair color, undertones, and things like that that we can encounter in the very wide and various human population. They are nearly all exclusively for European skin tones. Even today, we do see a slightly wider range being talked about. A lot of the new versions are coming out of Asia. So there's still a limited skin tone range in a lot of these, but it is something that I have seen discussed at current day, trying to broaden the scope out to include a wider range of skin tones. And interestingly enough, that idea wasn't completely absent in the past either. In 1931, I came across a series of articles analyzing what sort of color tones would work best for people with darker skin tones, specifically aimed at the black population in the United States. The woman who wrote these articles was not, from what I can tell, black herself, but she at least does acknowledge the fact there is a wide range of tones that have to be accounted for within darker skin populations, just as in lighter skin, that there will be a variance in light, dark, warm, cool, gray, or vibrant, and that all all of these things need to be taken into account, even if overall, in her opinion, people with darker skin tones can carry stronger color notes. 
She is interestingly enough teaching classes at the YWCA on this. So this is something that you're expecting to be able to find in-person classes on beyond just these articles. But in general, this time period seems to be really tied up with the idea of cool and warm undertones or intermediate and varieties of that type, which I didn't find in earlier versions. So clearly the origins of where the idea of color analyzing comes from, the science behind it perhaps, if we can find it, does not specifically have to do with warm or cool undertones or even necessarily skin tone. So we're going to have to go back even further. At the end of the 19th century, beginning of the 20th century, before makeup really became popular and undertones became so important, there were a lot of very prescriptive lists that simply stated if you are part of this specific group, wear these sorts of tones. One article from 1890 says that don't wear bright red if you're older, pink is for the young, that dark sage green is universally becoming, pale green is for those with good complexions, and darker green is for brunettes, and most interestingly it states that magenta should be suppressed. Only a dazzling beauteous being could survive the uglifying effect of this depraved color, and then it must be combined with white. Very strong opinions about a very strong color. This seems to be the way that a lot of lists go. They might say brunettes are supposed to wear these three colors, blondes are supposed to wear these three, perhaps they might talk about redheads, they might talk about age variants, but they seem to have a somewhat arbitrary set of rules. I did find a book talking about these sorts of rules as far back as 1881, however. Miss Oki's book on the mysteries of artistic costumes, where she goes into an extensive list of the different colors and types and do's and don'ts, and her book seems to be taken and reprinted in a number of different magazines and newspapers of the time, so things like this would have been fairly extensively available to a pretty wide audience. One of the more interesting things, though, I did find in the 1890s was a recommendation that women actually go to see an artist who would pick out the main tones of color from their skin, their lips, cheeks, hair, eyes, and give them a little color palette of sorts so they could then walk around and test things out when they were shopping. So there were ideas like this that were based more off of your intuition than simply a prescribed set of rules. But for the most part, that's what I could find. Some of them take into account the massive quantity of variations that you should wear different colors for daytime versus evening. If you say look good in rose during the daytime, you should change it to crimson in the evening. The, the change of personality, the change in light, the change in age, the change in overall fashionable colors, you might need to constantly keep up and update what you are going for. Interestingly enough though, a lot of the lists that I was finding in terms of what these general groups are supposed to wear seemed very consistent and almost copy and pasted. Simply saying things like brunettes should always wear red, yellow, sometimes they'd mention pink, sometimes they'd say green and purple is okay, that blondes should wear paler greens, soft mauves and rose, and anything in a semi-tint range, anything basically more muted. Blues were also particularly great. But in general, there's a lot of variety that they mention but don't really give a list for because it just gets too complicated. Someone has olive skin or is particularly florid, meaning that they flush easily, or if they're particularly pale and they're trying to bring out the color in their cheeks. So much of it came down to simply hair color as the main base for what people should wear. So clearly by this point there's an established set of rules that they seem to be repeating over and over again. They had to have gotten it from somewhere. Nearly everything is just quoting previous articles whether they say so or not, so there has to be an origin to this. And that I had to travel back to the 1850s for. The concept of color theory is definitely ancient. Artists have been understanding how color pigments work with each other for centuries. However, to put it in scientific terminology with agreed upon words and systems and images, is a little bit more complicated. And that really takes place in the 1850s with Michel Chevreul. And he is a Frenchman who worked in the dyeing industry. So he was trying to come up with a very precise scientific theory that would help them keep dye colors consistent. And in doing so, he wrote a book that included the color wheel that we are familiar with today, that talks about colors that are complementary to each other, being across the wheel from each other, that are analogous right next to each other, and how these different colors will affect the things around them. You 
You might have seen this in terms of some tricks of the eye things over the years where they take say a yellow square and put it in four different colors and it looks like four different yellows based on what's surrounding it. And it's that theory that basically goes viral out of his book in the 1850s. By 1852, his work had been translated into English and magazines and newspapers were really picking up on this and printing it over and over and over again because he doesn't just talk about it in terms of figuring out colors for dyes, he does also talk specifically about what sorts of colors would be flattering for certain complexions. Peterson's Magazine, which is a very popular fashion magazine at the time, writes a very extensive article talking about what colors of bonnets women should wear and how to pair up one color with another. If this color doesn't really work for you, make sure that you put a different color on the underside of the brim or in trim or flowers, whatever it is. And it goes into great detail about exactly why. And that's what I've been looking for the entire way through, which is the basic premise that colors that are opposite of each other on the color wheel are going to accent each other very strongly. If you wear purple, it will make the yellow more obvious. If you wear yellow, it will make the purple more obvious. So if perhaps a blonde wants to play down the yellow brassiness in their hair, they should not go with purple. Essentially, the key here was to figure out what underlying tones there were in each part of the complexion, where colors made up the skin, the eyes, and the hair, and figuring out whether you wanted to bring those colors out or help them recede by using the color wheel theory. Now, though this is specific to just base color tones, he talks a lot about how some things need to be more muted, some things need to be darker or brighter in order to balance these out because a soft green and a dark green will offer two very different versions. But the detail that is found in the book is reprinted over and over and over again. I was finding essentially the exact same article printed all the way through the 1850s, 60s, 70s, and even into the 80s, where we reached that point where they're just simply prescribing this is where blondes wear this and brunettes wear this, and they had long ago stopped quoting who it was from or even stopped discussing where the origins of the theory came from. So they had completely forgotten why they came up with these rules in the first place and instead were just talking about the rules. And that brings us back around to where we are at today. So all of these really complex versions where you can figure out which one of 12 different seasons you are and how that's supposed to work for what exact tones you should wear basically comes down to that color theory. Interestingly enough, even having gone all the way back to this 1852 article, there are mentions beyond European skin tones. Now, of course, before I show this, the terminology that's being used is incredibly antiquated and is specific to the time. It does not appear that any of the discussion in here is meant to be derogatory, but the terminology used back then, obviously we no longer use, because of a lot of negative associations with it. But Chevrolet does talk about that though we might want to diminish, say, the yellow tones in paler skin because it starts to look a bit more jaundiced, that is not always going to be the case with darker and richer skin tones. He mentions specifically the American indigenous population with more warmth and coppers and yellows in their tones that are actually going to be better if they are amplified, that there are a variety of different skin tones coming out of Asia and different ones coming out of the area that is now India and Pakistan, so that different regions around the world, people are going to have different skin tone bases, and they might want to accentuate or de-accentuate colors depending on what works for them. So though he does not go into a very extensive list over what people should or shouldn't wear with these various different skin tones, he at least acknowledges that that is going to be the case and there is not one set of rules for every single group that's going to work. So honestly, that was a lot more than I expected to find that far back, especially for the fact that we are still grappling with those sorts of issues today, that these things are not universal ideas and that pretty much the entire thing comes down to the concept of whether you like something or not, or more specifically, whether the person analyzing you likes something or not. Because as we moved through the years and we lost the original scientific meaning behind all of this, where you could choose what you wanted to accent or downplay, it became a matter of what the person coming up with the new system thinks is good or bad. And so there are so many limitations within that. Add in the fact that historically in the 19th century, people were still going to have things custom made. 
even if they were going into department stores, which were becoming incredibly common and popular in the United States in the 19th century, they're still getting hands-on service. You wouldn't walk into a store and take something off the shelf. You would go in and get professional advice. So a lot of the early versions of these color analyzing systems were not meant for the everyday person, but were meant for employees who were working in the fashion industry to be able to help their customers choose better. Of course, this starts to change as we reach into the 20th century and department stores start putting things out on shelves for people to figure out on their own, makeup coming into popularity. Suddenly everyone needs assistance because they've never had to figure that out before. As we get into the 1950s and 60s, no longer is it the common thing to have that professional assistance. So instead people are having to solve this problem entirely on their own. And that is why all of these new systems pop up to try and help you along the way to make better judgment. Today, it therefore makes perfect sense why we are seeing another resurgence. We are going through another big shift in the fashion industry, which is that we are shopping online. We can't even try these things on and see if the color looks good on us in person, let alone have anyone offer their advice on it. So we're now in another point where we need even more assistance in figuring out what's going to look good on us before we can even see it. So it makes perfect sense why this is a modern trend, but it is important to note the origins of these systems come simply from color theory. And while you can go on TikTok and try the multitude of filters that are supposed to be able to tell you, or go pay a professional to give you their opinion, or go through the numerous books or other resources you can find online, the entire thing will come down to the same basic concept, just distilled down into rules and regulations, make it a little bit easier to understand, but theoretically, are inevitably going to limit you in a lot of ways as well. So go forth, learn some color theory, have fun, and you can figure out what colors you actually like to wear based off of the wide range of options out there. There's not one right way to do this, so don't worry if it's not making sense to you and it's not working out. It all comes back down to whether you like that color or not.